Hello, poetry fans. This is Jim Ransom joining you again to read um, some poems that I liked during the past week. I'm getting to this program a little later than usual, but I hope you won't mind. We're going to hear several by Billy Collins, um, who, if you don't know, is probably my favorite poet. And then one by Joy Harjo, um, and then I'll finish with one of my own. We'll start with some short poems by Billy Collins from his book, um, if I can find it here, here it is, entitled uh, Musical Tables. And that's his audience, of course, the cow on the couch. <laughs> now, um, these are just a few lines long, this, these poems. Uh, they're, they're not like his other poems. They're sort of like aphorisms, except that uh, he uses his usual effective and often humorous method by giving each poem a bit of a twist at the end. The first one I'm going to read is entitled Dog. When she runs in her sleep, eyelids twitching, legs churning sideways on the floor, I wonder if she's chasing a squirrel or being chased by an angry farmer waving a rake. <laughs> that's, that's a good poem. But all of the poems in this book, Musical Tables, are short poems. Um, so let's turn to another one. This is called Look, the Morning Lake was smooth as a mirror. A few angels were even seen flying down just after dawn to check themselves out. <laughs> if that isn't characteristic of Billy, I don't know of anything that would be. So then... Um, here's another one. This is maybe two lines longer, and it's entitled Headstones. If the dates show the husband died shortly after the wife, first Gladys, then Harry, Betty followed by Tom, the cause is often gradual starvation, and not a broken heart. <laughs> well, you, you've heard me say that women do most of the work in the world. So <clears throat> it's no wonder that without their ministrations, the men left behind starved to death. Or at least that's the theory, I think, behind that poem. Um, <clears throat> and then one more from from uh, Musical Tables by Billy Collins. <laughs> it is called Poetry. As if it were not hard enough, whenever my pencil moves along the page, the pink eraser end points up. A little finger wagging, reminding me of our appointment. <laughs> Our appointment with a page, I think it means. <coughs> well, that's typical Billy Collins. And if, if, you, if you want to get this book, Musical Tables, let me tell you, it's not counting the end pieces and all. It's 152, uh, it's 151 pages long. So it's got a lot of these uh, little tables in it, like child astronomy. After many hours of peering into a telescope, Goldilocks discovers a dipper that is just right. <laughs> oh, my. Okay, now let's take a look uh, at... Um, 
Uh, what? Billy Collins. Oh, yes, Billy Collins. <laughs> I should remember this. Billy Collins likes short poems. I mean, to write 153 of them, you have to like them. And he says, I love the suddenness of small poems. I think most of us do, um, although I myself do not write that kind of poem most of the time. But you have to have the sales force of Billy Collins to get a publisher to take you seriously. Now, let's look at um, a poet with an American Indian heritage, Joy Harjo, Joy Harjo, uh, An American Sunrise, and I, I don't know if you can see her well enough. You probably can. This is a picture of Joy Harjo on the back cover of the book. <clears throat> but Joy Harjo is a is is a uh, a formidable poet. And here's a, a poem that she writes entitled Rabbit Invents the Saxophone. Um, and in this poem, Joy uses the character of Rabbit, who also appears in a lot of the Uncle Remus stories from your childhood. Uh, and Rabbit really is more attached, or used to be attached at least, to the Negro, what was called Negro heritage, American uh, the black American um, mythologies and uh, really very clever stories that I at least grew up with when I was a kid and which had a great following at that time. I don't know whether that stuff is still used for uh, in the education of small children or not. My guess is that it might not be PC anymore. It might not be PC anymore to, to do that. And that's a shame because some of those stories were really wonderful. But anyway, here's one in that same genre by Joy Harjo. It's called Rabbit Invents the Saxophone. When one of the lost trails of tears wound through New Orleans, Rabbit that ragged trickster, decided he wanted to be a musician. He was tired of walking. And they had all the fun. They got all the women. They were surrounded by fans who gave them smokes and drinks, and he could have all kinds of friends to do his bidding. But Rabbit hadn't proved to be musical. When he'd led it stomp dance, no one would follow. No shell shaker would shake shells for him. He was never invited to lead, even when the young ones were called up to practice. The first thing a musician needs is a band, he said to his friends. The hottest new music was being made at Congo Square. So many tribes were jamming there, African, native, and a few a remnant French. Making a new music of melody, love, and beat. Rabbit climbed up to the stage, but had nothing to offer. Just his strut, charming banter, and what looked like a long stick down the right leg of his pants. Musicians are musicians. No trick will get by. You either have it or want it, nothing else will fly. Do you know any songs? What can you play? Can you sing? Do you have a piano, tuba, or strings? That was the voice of the crowd. The musicians began vamping. 
What can this rabbit cat do? Is he going to blow hot air or fart in the rain? Rabbit turned his back to the band like that genius Miles Davis, pulled out his stick and made a horn with his hands. This stick is so special, bragged the rabbit, as he turned back to the jam. No one else has one like this. You've never heard it before. It's called a saxophone. Rabbit's newborn horn made a tip in the sky. He made old women dance, and the girls fall to their knees. It made singers of tricksters. It made tricksters of players. It made trouble wherever it sang after that. The last time we heard Rabbit was for my cousin's run for chief. There was a huge feed. Everyone showed up to eat. Rabbit's band got down after the speeches. We danced through the night and nobody fought. Nor did anyone show up the next day to vote. They were sleeping. <laughs> Joy Harjo has her own voice. If any of you have ever read her, and maybe you have, many of you probably uh, more than I have. Some of her poems are rather long, like the one entitled Washing My Brother's Body. Um, and I don't want to read that because it's too long for this session. But <clears throat> I would certainly uh, not... Uh, discourage you from getting this book, An American Sunrise, Poems by Joy Harjo. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Now we're going to finish up with one of my old poems. It's from this book, Immortal Prairie, which was published, oh, gee, Quite a while ago, when was it published? It was published by Friesen Press in 2015. So it's about nine years old now. Um, <clears throat> and let's read this poem from Immortal Prairie. And I think it's right here near the front, if I can find it. Uh, yeah, it's one of the early poems in this book. It's called Missing the Prom. Uh, and the epigram is an emergency consultation. Some of you will remember that I once was a physician. And this is pretty much a true story. Like scattered stones or errant rolling gravel, the welts spread from that perfect tiny navel upward between the firm breasts and over her shoulders and settled between her shapely thighs like boulders in red. And besides all that, they burnt like fire. She, alarmed, repaired her to her powerful sire who sent her forthwith to her wiser mother, who brought her in, the two of them in terrible bother, not least about the prom upcoming and the lure of her first big date. Oh, to be ravished, not by a gallant lover, but by a drug unknown to cause anything other than a wholesome benefit, a headache cure. How do we tell her that this too will all be passed down in legend, in laughter, and in story at the last. Well, <laughs> um, these poems were all picked because of their humorous core uh, concepts. I hope you enjoyed them all. And by the way, this book, Immortal Prairie uh, is out of print. Um, 
Maybe a few hundred copies were printed and quite a few were sold. And um, at poetry readings that I had, especially at the Doctor's Day celebrations in Topeka years ago, I gave away a lot of them and sold some of them because the money then went to uh, charity. And <clears throat> um, But I still have a few copies on hand, and if you don't have it already, I'll send you one at no cost to you. I'll pay for the mailing. You don't have to worry about it. But I have simply one request, and that is don't ask for more than one copy and send me an email at the following address, jimransom506 at gmail.com, along with your mailing address. I won't do me any good just to have your, your email address. And I'll send you one at no charge, but I will need your address. So that's to be sent to jimransom506 at gmail.com. jimransom506 at gmail.com. As I mentioned, there's a one book limit, and it's not going to cost you anything, not even postage. I'll cover the whole thing for you. Come back. Come back next week for some more poems. And in the meantime, I'll be sending out books, I hope. But while we're waiting for next week to get here, let's pray for good weather. We're having a wonderful day today in western Pennsylvania. And I usually check the weather back in Kansas, where I came from, and it's, if anything, even better today. So, get that energy level up, and let me hear from you, and I'll see you next week at this time. Bye now.